All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome, affiliates, to the No Read Book Club, which means you don't have to read the book <laughs> you, unless you want to, unless it sounds fascinating and you decide to pick it up. But I'm basically going to give you the best ideas that I got from, from the book. Uh, of course, it's through my filter, through my lens. So I'm sure if you end up reading the book, you might have other ideas that really stand out to you. But these are what helped me, uh, is making a difference for me. And without further ado, let's talk about it. So the book that I've been reading uh, is from an author named James Altucher, A-L-T-U-C-H-E-R. And I've actually enjoyed listening to his podcast for quite some time. Um, he is uh, a an entrepreneur, a kind of motivational type speaker, but he's also a comedian. So I think that's partly why I like his, his style, I like his voice. He keeps things light, but he also tends to exaggerate. So that's the part I don't like. He, 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 he exaggerates. Uh, whenever I hear something from him where I could go verify the results, I feel like he exaggerates a lot. So <laughs> that's, that's the drawback of his work and his writings. But um, if you set that aside and really take the principles and some of the examples that hopefully aren't exaggerated, uh, it is inspirational and, and it's helpful. So let me just, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look through the chapter headings. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to pick particular chapters that were, that made a difference for me and then what the idea was. So the first chapter that, that really helped me was the 1% rule, the 1% rule. And the overall idea is this. If you improve 1% each day on a particular process that you, that you do every day, then by the end of one year, 365 days, by the end of that, you will be 78.8, 37, 37.8 times better in that process. So almost, let's just round it up. 38 times better in that process than you were at the beginning of the year by a 1% improvement each day. So that's really significant. Now, on the other hand, if you decrease your ability of that skill or process by 1% each day for a whole year, by the end of the year, you will be down to only 3% of your original skill level. So uh, yeah, which is, which is shocking. So that really inspired me to take more seriously this idea that we are always either strengthening our muscles or we are atrophying our muscles in any area of life. Now, whether or not we actually, if we don't do something, do we really atrophy 1% every day? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's just a, that's just a, it's just a number and a way of thinking. It's not literal, right? But it is true that if you improve 1% every day, you will be 38 times more skillful at that. 38 times, not, not you know, you're not going to be three times better. You're going to be 38 times better at that, at the end of each year, at the end of the year. So that really inspired me to start looking Every, you know, I know I'm probably a bit more organized and productive than most people, but I, this is my, my new habit that I'm doing. And I don't do it perfectly, but at the beginning of each hour during my work day, I don't do this when I'm relaxing it in the evening or weekends, but during the work day, at the beginning of each hour, I take just two minutes, it really only needs to take two minutes to briefly think about my past hours activity and how can I improve that activity by 1%. And then I write it down. Okay, that past activity I did, I think I can improve it by 1%. And what do we mean by improve by 1%? It could mean, is there a way to do that activity more efficiently? Is there a little, a little bit faster? possible? Can I do that activity with more um, thoughtfulness to the detail? How do I do that? Can I do that activity with a little bit more joy? So 1% improvement can be either in speed or quality or in a sense of 
virtue or values that we're implementing there. Okay, so that's what I do. At the beginning of each hour, I spend one to two minutes thinking about the past hour, 1% improvement. I write it down. And then I take another minute or so to say, well, this hour's activity, what can I do to improve it? Is there a 1% improvement I'm working on right now? And 1% is so, such a nice, it's so small. It's, it's, you know, it's so small. Like for example, um, if I take, if I usually take 10 minutes to do something, okay, let's just say 10, let's just say, uh, yeah, let's say one hour. Okay, if I usually take one hour to do something, right? One hour, 60 minutes times 60 seconds is 3,600 seconds is one hour, right? A 1% improvement would be, now I'm gonna take 3,564 seconds instead of 3,600, so, I mean, just as a just as an idea, right? Which means I'm how can I shave off thirty seconds? Right? It's not much. It's like how can I shave off thirty seconds if I did one act one hour? How can I how can I save just thirty seconds? Hmm. One idea might be: Have I even written down the process, the step by step process for what I'm going to do this hour? Have I even written it down? If I haven't even written down the step by step process, I can't even analyze it and how I make it more efficient. That's why I write down all my step-by-step -step processes. And a lot of you don't, uh, you know, some of you who've come to my classes and Q&A calls have seen this before, but I'm gonna show you. I, I literally write down my step-by-step -step processes. If I'm preparing a course, this is, the, this is the first session that I prepare for my beta course. This is what I do. You know, for the first 15 minutes, I do the following. The next 15 minutes, I do this, blah, blah, blah. And I have a process for my, my practice group. Okay, what do I do? How do I prepare my practice group? I open up this, I open up that, I open up this, and then what's the structure of the group? I do this, I do that, blah, blah. So I've written down everything, all of my processes, as much as I can. Do you have that? Is there a process that you do on a weekly basis or a daily basis that is hard to keep in your head? I mean, yeah, certain processes, it's like, okay, there's only two steps here. I don't have to write it down. But I feel like even if there's three or more steps, if I just take the one minute to write it down, it's helpful to not keep it in my head. And also, therefore, therefore I'm able to start making 1% improvements on it to say, oh, yeah, what's the 1%? For this step, is there a 1% improvement? And maybe I should write down that first step is really five micro steps. Let me write down the five microsoft so I can start making a little bit of improvements. And yes, over time, it's not like we have to read every word of our steps. Of course, you, 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 over time, you keep looking at it again and again and again, it becomes so familiar. But still, you take a moment every once in a while and go, hmm, that one micro step, is there a 1% improvement there? I mean, this is how factories become more and more efficient. Isn't that right? The Toyota method, right? Kaizen right? Continuous small improvements, right? So this is how factories become more efficient. It's like, let's tweak the machine just a little bit more. And if we tweak the machine a little bit more, our system, you are, your, process, your, your day is a machine. Your day is a machine. It's a series of systems. It's a series of processes. It might be a very messy machine because you haven't really looked at it carefully, but it is a machine. But if you don't have it, if you haven't written it down, you can't, you can't know the structure in the system, therefore you can't improve it. But once you've written it down, you go, okay, that one thing, I can improve it just a little bit. And if I improve a little bit, guess what? Every single time I do it, I'm saving 30 seconds. And I say, well, 30 seconds is nothing. No, it's not nothing. If you do that process every single week, that's 50 times 30 seconds, right? And every single time you improve it, you can improve another 30 seconds. Okay, now you're improving, you're saving a minute. And it's not just that you're saving, oh, George, come on, give me a break. 30 seconds, no big deal, one minute. Well, it's, it's the energy that you save also that makes your, your day just a little bit smoother. And that's, that just a little bit smoother actually has, makes a, a, a difference to the rest of your day. So 1% improvement. I, I really found that helpful. And I, that's what I'm starting to do every, every time. Okay, so in the next chapter, let me know. Are, are there any questions? Does this make sense? Uh, we are, you know, we're a small group here. So I do wa welcome you to unmute if you want to say, you know, 10, 20 second reflection. Does that make sense? You know, any questions you have? 
Um, yes. So, yeah. So, Peter, thank you for your comment there. Um, yeah. So, one percent approach would make it more healthy instead of instead of so you know trying to improve yourself dramatically every day. It's it's uh, it can be too stressful. So I think I like the 1% improvement idea. Every process I do, I just, yeah, 1% improvement, just 1%. If I just keep doing that every time, then even though I don't do the task every single day of the year, I won't, I won't make 38 times better by the end of the year. But even if I've become one and a half times better by the end of the year, that's great. Because in, in 10 years, I'll probably become 10 times better. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. Um, and Utah has a great idea. It's like it's kind of like learning one new word a day in a foreign language. 365 words a year. That's that's more than you would have learned if you had stretched yourself out and tried to learn 300 words in a month and probably forgot them all or whatever, you know. But it's like it's you know, yeah, very good. So um, and Wendy says it's like lifting weights. You add one pound you know, improvement over time, increasing one pound at a time, you get stronger, more fit. Absolutely. Absolutely. One pound seems like it's nothing, but it is something because your muscles understand what that means and it gets, gets stronger. So great examples. Okay. So the next chapter that made a difference for me was 10,000 experiments. And this is really the core of his book. Okay. So the 10,000 experiments idea really came from the Thomas Edison story. Uh, if you've never heard of uh, this, this true, true story, these are facts, right? You can, we, can, we can look at history, Google, Google this. So this was really when Thomas Edison was making the storage battery. Um, and he uh, actually, let me uh, uh, see here. Let me, I actually wrote a blog post about this. Um, you know, and, and you could, uh, I just want to show you. So I actually, funny thing was, I actually wrote the blog post before I read the book. So, so it, it just, it's a synchronicity, but, um, and I actually did the research about the Thomas Edison story before I read the book. Okay. So um, Thomas Edison, of course, known for the light bulb, he actually constructed 3000 different theories in connection to the light bulb. Each of them felt like reasonable to him, apparently true, but only in two of the cases, two out of 3,000 did the light bulb theories work. That's incredible. How many, how many thousands, how many hundreds of experiments have you done in whatever field you want to become great at? You know, and this is, this is something that, and let, let me just keep going and then I can stop the screen share. This is, uh, Thomas Edison worked on a storage battery which actually created more wealth for him, right? Interestingly, right? He got richer from the storage battery than the light bulb. A lot of people don't know that. Okay, so the storage battery, he worked harder on this thing. Nine, over 9,000 experiments. And it's still, he still hadn't found the right answer. 9,000 experiments. I mean, <laughs> I'm just thinking, my God, even if I did a, for a whole year, that means I had to do three experiments a day every single day for a whole year, right? 9,000 experiments. And of course, his friend said, isn't it a shame? So much effort. You didn't get any results? And then Edison said, no, wait, what are you, what are you talking about? I've gotten a lot of results. I have several thousand things that don't work. I, I don't have to do that same experiment again because I know it didn't work. So this is something that I see in my clients all the time, right? My clients said, George, I launched this online course and it didn't work. So your your teachings don't work <laughs> did i tell you to launch one online course and then therefore it didn't work and no i mean if you know anything about me you know i'm all about experiments and you know you can if you watch me watch what i do and not just what i teach but what i do is i launch a, a course every single month and i've done so for years so i launch a course every month and that's even too little right i mean you, you shouldn't probably launch, you know, I, actually some of my students launch two courses a month, which is amazing. I can only muster one course a month. And some of you can only muster launching one course every three months. And that's okay too, especially if you're really busy, right? But 12 courses a year is only 12 experiments a year. 
Now, actually, before I launch a course, I also do survey. I survey my audience out of these. So what I actually do is I, I brainstorm a bunch of course topics. So you might say, I'm not, not only doing 12 experiments a year. First, I brainstorm you know, at least five to 10 topics before I decide on one. So I, uh, you could say I, I'm already experimenting with five topics and then at, with 10 topics. And out of the 10, I then narrow it down to three that I think based on what I know of my audience, they probably would like these three best. And then I survey them. So that's another experiment. So out of, I really, for every single course, it's like I do five or 10 experiments for every course launch. So let's just say five. That means really each year, if I launch 12 courses, I have 60 experiments a year. You see what I mean? I do 60 experiments a year. And so when someone complains to me and says, George, I launched, I, I took a course of yours about creating and launching courses. I, I launched one course and, and nobody bought. I'm, and then, so therefore your course doesn't work. I'm like, are you serious? Did you actually study the course? Because I told you to launch a lot so that you can see which one worked and you didn't even take a survey. <laughs> this is literally someone said to me this recently. Oh, I launched the course, it didn't work. I'm like, did you even take a survey? No, I didn't. I mean, it's like, come on. Edison, 9,000 experiments, and you told me you launched one course and one experiment and you, you give up? I, and, or if you say, George, I, I, you know, I, I had three exploratory calls with potential clients and none of them wanted to buy my service, so I don't think I should be in business. Three experiments? Are you kidding me? Okay, so basically what James Altucher inspires us to do and you know, based on the Thomas Edison story is 10,000 experiments. Now, why 10,000 experiments? Now, now it's, it's kind of clever what he's doing because usually we hear that to become a master at something, you need 10,000 hours of practice. And not just practice, deliberate practice. Right? <laughs> What's deliberate practice? Deliberate practice is like carefully practicing a specific segment of a skill, micro skill, practicing a micro skill, not 10, for 10,000 hours, but for in, in those 10,000 hours, you are practicing specific micro skills to get, get better at the micro skill and then practicing the next micro skill, get better at it. And then, and then connecting those two micro skills together to have a better, 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 bigger skill. That's what deliberate practice means. And James Altucher, the whole book is called Skip the Line. Okay, Skip the Line is what the book is called, which I really don't like the idea. The idea is like you somehow take advantage of society and you, 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 you go past people who are waiting in line and you go to the front of the line. The idea is basically the, the, the more be, be benevolent way of looking at it, ethical way of looking at it is how do we do things in the most productive manner, in the most efficient manner, and not just in the way that everyone is doing it without thinking. So that's what he means by skipping the line. It's like, if someone, if everyone's waiting in line when there really, there really is no need for a line, that's what he means. There's no need for a line. Why are you all lining up? You could just go to the front and do this. That's what he means. So it's like, don't just follow society's rules. Oh, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to get this certificate and then that degree and then this and then this and this and this before you can call yourself. And then 10,000 hours of practice before you should call yourself a master. He says, wait a second. There's a more efficient way of doing it. It's called the 10,000 experiments rule. Now, ironically, 10,000 experiments probably takes longer than 10,000 hours, right? <laughs> but, but, but what he's saying is that really, if you, if you aim for several hundred experiments, even 100 experiments is more than most people in your field are doing. So if you aim for 100 experiments, you're going to already be one of the, probably the top 10% in your field because you have done enough experimentation in your field to understand what works and what doesn't work. Most people in your field don't do the experiments. They study, they read books, they take courses, they may have gotten degrees. And yes, those courses and books are about people who have done some experiments, but to do your own experiments allows you to actually learn much better than by reading a book, right? And, and when you design, of course you read books, of course you can take courses, of course, you know, that helps with some shortcutting with, or that helps with some understanding of what the history of your field is so that you don't have to make the same mistakes over and over again. But even after your study, if you don't do your own experiments, you won't come up with new ideas that make you one of the best in your field. 
And so one example of experiments is the way I think about content creation, right? Every single time I make a video or write an article, I'm making an experiment. An experiment is here's an idea I wanna share with you. Let's see if it works. So I don't wanna attach myself to, oh, did this article go viral? Did this video get liked a lot? No, I don't wanna attach myself to any of those metrics. I track those metrics so I can look over time which experiments work. But every single thing I put out there is an experiment. So by this point, I have made a thousand videos. Yes, I've made more than a thousand videos and written more than a thousand articles at this point. This is over years, of course. So I have done a thousand experiments and not surprisingly, gratefully, my business is doing very well. And I really have seen that when I put myself out there hundreds of times, looking at them all as an experiment to say, hmm, I wonder if this idea will work. And by the way, experiments, do most experiments succeed? No, most experiments fail. But if you look at failure from the larger perspective, what is failure? Failure really should be looked at. So there's, there's two, two ways of making mistakes, commission and omission. Two ways of failing. Commission, meaning I did something and I, and I failed or I made a mistake. Omission is the true failure that we should all be more concerned with, which is I didn't do it at all. So if I didn't do it at all, I wouldn't have even known whether that would have worked for me. Okay. Let's say, let's say that the lottery was much easier to win, which by the way, in your career, your career and the success of your career is like playing the lottery, except it's much easier to win. So lottery in the United States, it's something like one out of 15 million chance of winning the, the jackpot, something like that. Right. So it's, it's next to impossible, right? You buy a lottery ticket, you might as well be throwing money away. In your career, it's more like one out of 1,500 is the odds, really, literally. So by the time you make your 1,500th, or sorry, 1,500, by the time you put out 1,500 articles or videos, okay, let's just say with, with content, it's like 1,500. That's what I'm going to say to you, okay, 1,500. If you write 1,500 articles and, and videos, I can almost guarantee that you will become a success in your field. I can't guarantee it, obviously, but I've only done about a thousand and I'm already quite successful in a very competitive field. How many articles have you written? How many videos have you put out there? Probably not even close to, probably not even 150. So there's your homework. Okay, 1500 articles or videos will make you a success in your field, probably. Really, I would, I would bet on it. I would actually invest and bet on that, 1,500. Now, how quickly can you do the 1,500? That's up to you. That's up to you. If you do three per week, okay, and there's, that's 150 per year, working 50, if you put out content 50 weeks, uh, if you put out content 40 weeks in a year, that's 120 in a year. So that's 10 years before you get to top of your field or at least have your business be a success. You put out five a week. When I started, I put out five per week. And I did that for six months. So whatever that, that calculates out to 26, five, 100, yeah, about, what is it? 26 times five. So yeah, I did about 130, you know, 130 right out the gate for six months. And that really got me some initial traction. People started noticing me. And then I started doing only three a week and then blah, blah, blah. Actually, somehow cal the calculations, I, I, have, I know I have a hundred, uh, a thousand, more than a thousand, well over a thousand videos on my YouTube. So, and I usually wrote, you know, I always wrote a small article. So anyway, so um, however the calculations work out, I've been doing videos for a long time. So more, more than just five years, it's been, it's been a long time. So, all right. So content, I'm going to give you the 1500 number as the number of experiments that will make you your business a success for sure. Of course, all the way, th all the way there, you will be finding success along the way, but 1500 aim for that. Okay. Now for your offerings, for your online courses or for your coaching packages, or for the way that you describe your consulting offer, whatever it is that you offer as a service or a product, I'm going to give you the number of 150. If you do 150 experiments of what you offer, you will find 
traction. I can almost guarantee you, I can't guarantee, but it's very probable that 150 experiments will get you to be like, oh my God, this is my career is gonna, my career is gonna work. And this business is going to work out. I have solid confidence that this is gonna work. And most of you have only done like five experiments. So each experiment is like, you send out an email with this particular description. You've written out, this is my coaching offer, my consulting offer. You've posted it on social media. Every time you, if you post it on social media and send out an email and do it on all social, that's only one experiment. Yes, that's only one. Because every time you describe your coaching or consulting offer, that's one experiment, the way you wrote it. Now, sleep on it. Next week, you write it differently. So, okay, I know I could describe my coaching offer differently. Let me sleep on it and just write it. Don't look at the original version. I'm going to write a totally different version. And of course, you're going to have some things the same. But I'm going to try to write a different version next week. That's a second experiment. A third experiment might be, okay, I'm going to try launching this course. That's a third experiment. Oh, I'm going to try launching this uh, group program. That's a fourth experiment. I have definitely launched more than 150 experiments for offerings courses, the way I describe my, my coaching, the way I describe my group program, I've done at least 150 over the last, well, 11 years that I've been in business. And not surprisingly, I'm quite confident that my business will continue to succeed because I know out of those 150, there's about 10 that work really, about 15, I would say that work really well, that I can continue repeating those 15 over the course of my lifetime. Of course, always experimenting more to see certain things. Every year, I still experiment. Every year, I launched, like I said, 12 courses. I would say probably, now, now that I've done so many, I would say out of the 12 courses, every course does okay. You know, it's like, ah, it's okay. Um, and out of the 12, about three of them do really well, do really well. And that's those of you who, all of your affiliates here watching this, that's when, that's when your affiliate payment goes up each certain month. I'm like, how come the affiliate payment is so much higher that month? Because that course did really well. Okay. And then certain months, it's like, ah, oh, it's only a few dollars, whatever. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah, so, so month. One of my experiments that didn't work out as well. Right. Um, so that's the assignment for you is for your offers, 150 offers. How long will that take you? Well, depends on how many offers you put out there every month. Now, you could realistically only put out not more than two offers a month. Really. I mean, because your audience will be like, what, you're offering something again? Oh, you have something again? So up to two offers a month is possible. One offer a month is pretty common. So you really only have 12 to 24 experiments a year that you can do this. So let's just say 12 let's just say um, 18 is the average that you do. So sometimes you do one, sometimes you do two a month. So 150 divided by 18 is, it's an eight year process. Now, obviously it's like, George, I have to wait eight years before I can start making some money. No, obviously not. When you start, when you start making an offer each year, let's say you make 18 different offers or 12, let's say 12, probably one or two of them are going to do pretty well. Like, oh, I made five, 10,000, 20,000 on that offer, okay? Or 30,000, whatever well means for you. And then the other, and then there's maybe another three that did okay. Oh, I made, you know, two, five, 10,000 on that one. And then the others, five, well, however many left are left, six, seven, eight, whatever, are gonna be like, ah, made 500 to 1,000 on that offer. You see what I mean? So, you need, and of course, as you learn over time, oh, these offers really work. You're going to be able to say, well, let me do more of those offers. So, so, so essentially doing experiments. And the other thing I'm, I'll, and we'll, I'll close off with this. The 10,000 hour rule, he says the problem with the 10,000 hour rule is that you, you master something for 10,000 hours. You might realize you don't want to do it anymore for the rest of your life. You might get tired of it. And that does happen. It's like, why are you spending so much time mastering one skill set when you have so much possibility within you that you should be experimenting with a lot more different things. So if you experiment more, you actually respect your potential and you activate your potential by doing a lot of experiments and seeing which one worked because our calling is the intersection between our skills and passions and what the market, what the world wants from us. 
And in order to find that intersection, you have to experiment. You can't just be practicing one thing, become a master at it and decide, oh, maybe I don't even passionate about it. And maybe the world doesn't even want it that much. You've got to experiment with a wide range. So I can't believe that that was, well, those are the two most important chapters of the book out, out of the entire thing. But in the next session, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off uh, the book with the other, some of the other ideas that help. So I hope this is inspiring. Uh, this really made a difference for me just in thinking in terms of 1% improvement and experiments and doing more experiments. And, and therefore experiments, you don't attach yourself to it. Just, ah, oh, this is an experiment. And most experiments fail. So don't be surprised <laughs> when you put something out there and nobody buys, because that's normal. That's normal. That's normal. You have to do the next experiment now. Just say, hmm, I wonder which is going to be the one out of 10 that works or one out of five. Or as you get more understanding of your market, one out of three, that works. So I hope this helps and go forth, do your 1% improvements and do your experiments. And I'll see you in the next session or you'll watch the replay later. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye for now.